Curse of the Frog. When I was in high school, I knew a boy who went by the nickname Buana because he loved outdoor critters. He used to keep a pet snake, and every morning some of us boys would watch when it was feeding time. He would drag out his cardboard box and pull from his pocket a fresh frog he had just caught and drop it in the box with the snake. The snake didn't play with its food. As soon as it saw the frog, it would, with one or two quick strikes, swallow the frog head first. On several occasions, I watched this nighttime drama, and each time I felt ashamed to be attracted to such a gruesome spectacle. Buana and other boys told me I was just being squeamish, that there was nothing wrong with watching a snake kill a frog. We were simply watching nature do what nature does, survival of the fittest and all that. Still, I felt I was indulging in a guilty pleasure with the pet snake. Then came the night Buana dropped into the box an extraordinary frog. That is, if it is possible for a frog to be extraordinary. I'm going to call this frog Freddy because to me, he was extraordinary and deserving of a name. For one thing, Freddy was more aware of his surroundings than the other frogs I had seen in the box. He seemed to be aware that we boys were watching him from above, and he reacted almost as if he felt he was on stage, hopping blissfully around inside the cardboard walls and letting out a croak or two as he surveyed his new surroundings. Snake was coiled up in a corner, but when it heard Freddy's croak, it started slowly to uncoil itself. About the time Snake first eyed Freddy, Freddy eyed Snake. But Freddy didn't react as though he were afraid of the thing. No, he acted like he and the black reptile were playing a game. He hopped around like Muhammad Ali, almost like he was taunting Snake to make a move against him. And Snake, raising its head, attacked. But Freddy hopped away, and Snake banged its head hard against the side of the box. Recovering from its head knocking, Snake found Freddy in another corner of the box and struck again and again. Freddy jumped, leaving Snake to bang his head hard a second time against the wall of the box. Snake turned a third time and found Freddy bobbing and weaving and riveting in another corner, and a third time Snake lashed out. It missed and banged its head, but when Snake recovered from this third head banging, the frog was nowhere to be seen for Freddy had jumped clear out of the box. All of us boys saw Freddy jump out, and there he was between us, croaking, ribbit, ribbit, as though he was saying, I won, I won. Sadly, though, Freddy didn't win anything. It wasn't a game. It was supper time, and he was the food. Buona picked up the frog and dropped it back in the box. This, he said, has never happened before. I don't know if you can say that frogs have shoulders, but if the part of the frog extending from the head to the front legs are shoulders, then Freddy's shoulders dropped as though he had been cheated, as though he had played the game fair and square and been cheated. Snake struck immediately, and Freddy narrowly eluded his attacker, but there wasn't as much spring in Freddy's jump this time, maybe because he had used up most of his energy when he jumped clear out of the box or maybe because he had simply lost heart when he realized things were rigged against him. Anyway, Snake struck again, and this time it caught Freddy's right rear leg. I watched in horror as Freddy, with one leg in Snake's mouth, hopped around on his other three legs, trying to free himself. This was nature doing what nature does. It was terrible to look at, but at the same time I found myself unable to look away. With its leg deep in Snake's mouth, Freddy hopped around on three legs and in doing so delivered a terrible beating to his attacker, desperately pounding Snake's head against the floor and walls of the box. Snake was not used to his food putting up a fight like this. In all his previous feedings, it swallowed the frog head first and either crushed its head or smothered the poor thing once it was in his mouth. But Freddy, hopping around the box on three legs, refused to go down easily. If Snake were to win this battle, it would have to swallow Freddy backwards. And that is exactly what Snake did. Working his way higher and higher up until 
Freddy's whole leg completely disappeared inside Snake's crushing mouth. Buona and the other boys clearly relished the spectacle, and I, too, was secretly relishing it. But like I said, I felt I was dabbling in a pet sin against nature's God. I don't want to sound theological, but it did not seem right for me to enjoy anyone's life-and-death struggle with Snake, even if that someone was only a frog. Anyway, with Freddy's whole right rear side disappearing inside Snake's mouth, Snake worked on pulling in the other rear leg. This time, though, Snake had to work down from the top of the leg to the foot. As it did, I heard a snap. Snake's overpowering mouth had broken Freddy's left rear leg by bending it upward unnaturally. Snake continued to chew down on the leg until finally Freddy's little foot disappeared inside Snake's mouth. Still, Freddy fought on, hopping along on his two front legs. But Snake had the advantage now. Swallowing more and more of Freddy's midsection, Snake's head climbed slowly up as Freddy, with his front legs, tried to hold back the mouth that was swallowing him. Freddy's fight was doomed, however, for just like the rear leg which broke inside the mouth of Snake, first one and then the other of Freddy's front legs snapped as Snake swallowed the helpless limbs. In its struggle to swallow the frog that was going down with difficulty, Snake had raised the front half of himself almost perpendicularly from the floor, its eyes rising over the poor frog's head. Though Freddy was still alive, his head was sliding deeper and deeper into that all-consuming enemy, Snake. The last thing I could see, as the frog was being slowly sucked down into the blackness, was a sight that has haunted me ever since. Freddy's poor eyes, fixed on me. Never again did I want to be an eyewitness to nature just being nature. I know it's probably just my imagination, but whenever I feel I'm being swallowed up by life or time, those inexorable enemies that suck us all down into oblivion, I remember Freddy's eyes disappearing into the blackness of that maw, and I wonder if that frog placed a curse on me for watching him die and doing nothing. You've been listening to the Bayou Picayune podcast. For more information and additional content, go to davidpearson.net or pick up my books and Lead Us Not and Bayou Da Vinci on Amazon or any other major online retailer. If you like what you hear on the podcast, please subscribe and give me a review. Thanks for listening.